Mi karakia tato. Mano e mai te mauri nuku, mano e mai te mauri rangi, ko te mauri kei au. He mauri te pua, ka pakuru mai te pō, tau mai te mauri, haumie, huie, taikie. Kia ora koutou, um, no mai hari mai, welcome back to the second webinar in our Trans Health and Primary Care series. Some of you attended our first webinar a couple of weeks ago with Gender Minorities Aotearoa and we hope that many of you will also be interested in our third session with Counting Ourselves that's coming up on the 13th of July. But for now, it's great to be back and continuing this conversation with you all today. I'll um, introduce uh, the session a little bit before we hand over to our guests. And first, just yeah, a little bit about the webinar series. This is a collaborative project between ourselves at Tingako Kahukura, Gender Minorities Aotearoa, the Professional Association of Transgender Health Aotearoa, and Counting Ourselves. In each of these three webinars, we all bring a slightly different angle to the conversation. All of our different organisations and professions have different ways of looking at trans health and what the kind of issues and barriers and solutions might be. Um, and we were keen to hear in this conversation from a range of relevant perspectives. We think we're really stronger when we can value our differences and work collaboratively across, across and between sectors. So last time our guests were from Gender Minorities Aotearoa, this time um, we have three guests with us from who are members of PATHA, the Professional Association for Transgender Health Aotearoa. Um, Joey and I at Tingaka Kahukura are also members of PATHA, of PATHA. I'm realizing I didn't say my name at the beginning. Um, ko Moira Kluni took ingwa. I am Moira Kluni, I'm project lead at Tingaka Kahukura. Um, and yeah, pleased to be with you here today. Um, so yeah, talking about trans health, talking about informed consent models of care and particularly the role of um, general practitioners and primary care providers all feels um, extra relevant right now. As you might know, the government recently put money into trans health in the budget um, just recently and there's still lots of details to be worked out about how that money is spent, um, what those services look like, but we hope that this series of webinars is a chance to talk about um, what we think this could look like, what we think is important from our various different perspectives when thinking about um, trans health and primary care. We really, I guess, in the future want to see any GP, every primary care doctor feel supported and um, confident to work with trans people. Um, we do have some numbers here for people who like numbers look at my slides and um, lots of links to further research and uh, reading on our website's gender affirming care page as well as on the list of resources for this webinar but just wanted to start with you know people often want to know um, how many trans people are there how big is this population um, and just some recent studies uh, national surveys like youth 19 which talk to secondary school students found that one out of every 100 participants identified as trans or non-binary, so about 1% of their sample, and a further 0.6% were not sure of their gender at that time. So that's kind of one data point that we have. The Stats New Zealand Household Economic Survey, Stats New Zealand has started asking questions about gender in recent surveys, and we'll see this, the next census will be the first time that the questions are included in the census as well. But from this first, um, survey they found that 0.8 percent of the adult population of New Zealand identified as transgender or non-binary and um, the counting ourselves survey is another really crucial piece of research that um, talked to trans and non-binary people over the age of 14 in New Zealand a few years ago and this found um, really high levels of people who were wanting but not being able to access the gender affirming health care that they needed so ranging from 19% of unmet need for hormone treatment through to 67% of trans men wanting chest reconstruction surgery and about, as it says here on the slide, about half of trans women had an unmet need for voice therapy and feminizing genital surgery. So um, that's a few numbers and just setting the scene a little bit for the series. Um, I'll close down my slides and pass over to my colleague Joey to tell us a bit more about this particular session today. Kia ora, Joey. Kia ora, Moira. Thank you. Um, yes, I'm Joey McDonald, the Education Lead for Tingako Kahukura. Um, this is really going to be a conversation. This is a webinar that doesn't have like 
any further slides in it or any particular recorded videos or kind of preconceived content. So it really is going to be a conversation with our panelists who we will uh, let speak in a minute. <laughs> um, the, our colleague Jono is in the chat, monitoring the chat. Please feel free to put any questions or comments as we go along. You don't have to wait to do that. If something occurs to you and you want to note it down, um, that's always great for a conversation. We're thinking that this webinar is less about the nitty gritty details of what's the dosage, how do you prescribe, what's this blood test, what's that thing, because we do have some guidelines and resources that suggest quite specific ways of doing things, and they're all on our website and in various places. PATHA has national guidelines that are really great. So we're steering away from the nitty, nitty gritty clinical questions, and we're more thinking about the big picture of like, primary care as a site for gender affirming care to happen. Thinking about um, you know, our guests today who all work in primary care, we are suggesting that with support and resourcing, um, people working in primary, primary care, including you know, not just GPs, but also nurses, allied health workers, everybody working in that primary care space can find um, a way to, to increase access to gender affirming care, whether that's particularly within their service or finding the right referral pathway. We know that referrals sometimes are the right way, but we are also really trying to encourage as much as possible for people to be able to get their needs met just as they would with other kind of general healthcare needs that get met in primary care. We're not saying that's always possible, but we really want it to be much more possible because access is such a hard thing for people to get. Uh, and more some stats from counting ourselves that we thought were relevant. Um, there's a, a good one that says that more than half or 58% of the participants in that national survey of trans and non-binary people reported that their main healthcare provider knew most things or almost everything, that's a high bar, about healthcare for trans and non-binary people. That's quite heartening, actually. That's quite a, a high statement, you know, like that's praise. On the less good side, it also was reported that in the last 12 months, 13% of survey respondents were asked unnecessary or invasive questions about being trans or non-binary. That really, that, and those were questions that were unrelated to their health visit. And this is not specifically only talking about primary care, but it is inclusive of primary care. So we know that sometimes things go really well for people. And we also know that sometimes they really don't in terms of the care and the quality of care that they're getting. We also know that one in six participants reported that they had experienced reparative therapy or conversion practices. A professional had tried to stop them from being trans or non-binary. And that's a pretty terrifying prospect um, for trans and non-binary people to know that that's still happening in some of our health services. So we really want to lift the bar and we're not saying everybody is going to need to know how to do every aspect of this and you should be taking this on on top of everything else with no additional resourcing we're just going to slam it in there that's that's not the goal at all the goal is to try and say that improving access to care means improving support and resourcing and educating for people working in primary care there are you know general health care needs that trans and non-binary people have as well as gender affirming care health care needs and those are slightly distinct um, yeah, we will, we will be focusing on advocacy and pathways and how gender affirming care is not the scary too hard stuff. You don't have to sort of try and look away the too hard basket kind of place. We know that you're overworked. We know that you're slammed. We know that you're tired. Um, that's, that it's a huge strain. Everyone working in health, especially working as healthcare providers right now, um, we appreciate that you are just doing your best. So it's not, a, not an easy thing for us to say, hey, you should also be taking on a, a learning opportunity, but we're trying to do everything that we can to make it easier and more digestible, more understandable. Um, and you can always reach out to Tingako Kahukura if you have follow-up questions after this, we would um, be happy for you to do that. So yes, um, we, I wanted to say that Tingako Kahukura is doing a lot of advocacy for people working in health, and this is true for PATHA as well, right? The Professional Association for Transgender Health, Aotearoa. 
Tengaku Kahukura and Patha are working together to really try and advocate for you to be supported and cared for. And it, and we are kind of asking that you do the same, that you advocate for trans and non-binary people to be able to access gender affirming care as part of primary care. We know that it's not a one-way street in terms of that advocacy, but it is um, it's something that we all need to be doing if we can in our sphere of influence. Cool. Do we have some notes about practical things, Moira, that I'm handing back to you? The webinar is being recorded. I think so. Just, yeah, just noting that the webinar is being recorded. So you can watch it again later, or if you need to drop off partway through, you can come back and catch up with the rest of it. Um, or encourage other people to watch it later as well if you've got colleagues who have missed out today, but you think might be interested. Um, and if you missed the first session with Gender Minorities Aotearoa, that's up on our website now as well. Um, if you have any questions or comments during the session, please put them in the chat. Feel free to introduce yourselves in the chat if you'd like to. Um, this is a Zoom webinar, so we can't see any of your faces or hear any of you, um, but we can see your names if you, if you put them in the chat. So do feel free to add, add any comments or questions there. Also, this is a learning opportunity and it's part of an ongoing conversation. We want you to feel, as Joey was saying, really empowered to see gender affirming care as part of your regular job. And we really recognize that everyone's at a different level of knowledge and different level of comfort. Um, we're not gonna say this is, this is exactly how it should work and you should feel bad that you're not doing it already. Um, we want to encourage you to find the information and peer support that you need. And you'll be hearing from um, you know, our guests today about some different ways that that looks within different practices across the country as well. Um, also really aware that because people are at different points in their learning process, um, people might ask questions that um, don't necessarily quite sound right, or you might not feel confident that you know the right words to use or the right language. We want to really encourage you to ask questions if you have them. Um, this is a chance for professional development and we can't learn if we aren't willing to look like we don't know things. So do feel, do ask questions if you're sitting with something you're not sure about, then other people will be wondering the same thing, no doubt. Um, and last thing I had to say was the audience for this webinar is clearly people who work in primary care. We have three GPs with us today who will speak to their part in this work. Um, but we're also wanting to make this relevant to a wider range of clinicians, especially nurses and allied health workers. I know we had a lot of nurses register for the session today. Um, people working in mental health, um, really anybody working in that kind of primary care space or adjacent sectors. So yeah, please put your questions in the chat. If you've got any question, follow up questions afterwards, please get in touch through our website or email Joey or myself. Um, I think that's all the practical points. I'll hand back to you nice. Joey to introduce nice. our people. Thanks Hello. Moira. Yeah, I'd like to acknowledge our guests here with us today. We have Drs. Rona Carroll and Beth McElray and Rebecca Nichols. And it's so great to have you all here. I'm going to we're going to leap into a conversation with kind of a round. You're going to all answer the same question starting us off. It, the goal is really that you're situating yourself. Tell us a bit about where you're working. Um, I would love to hear something about the pathways or processes in your service that relate to gender affirming care. So I anticipate we don't have time to do a whole detailed description of every piece. But if there are particular highlights that you think are working really well, that might be something to focus on um, or any aspect really that you think is relevant in terms of situating yourself, people who are working in primary care, who are doing gender affirming care as part of that work. I might ask Rona to start us off. Does that sound okay? Sure. Kia ora. Um, Kia ora koutou. My name is Rona Carroll. I'm a, a you, she, her pronouns. I'm a GP in Wellington uh, and I work in a student health service uh, here in Wellington. So my role in this work clinically is that I am um, part of a small kind of gender affirming healthcare team within our service. Um, and uh, the main thing I do there is initiating gender affirming hormone therapy in, in primary care using a, a sort of informed consent approach and, and not referring to secondary care as a kind of routine automatic um, thing. Um, and I think, um, you know, it's a service, it's a kind of way of working that we've developed over time as we've learned and uh, come along on this journey. And one of the, the highlights, I think, and something really 
possibly sort of unique or different about our, our service is the interdisciplinary approach that we have. So I work really closely with two counsellors in our team and also particularly closely with a nurse. And I think that nursing role has been, um, yeah, just, just a really nice and that really great way of working together to support the people that we're seeing. Thank you. That's a great and very succinct highlight. I love it. Nailed it. All right. Next up, Rebecca. See if you can go <laughs> for as short a time, but with as much information. No challenge at all there. <laughs> Kia ora koto. I'm Dr. Rebecca Nichols. I'm a GP in Christchurch, Ojutahi. Um, and the, my pronouns are she and her. Um, so, no, I'm not going to do this as well as you, Rona, I can feel it already. Um, <laughs> so I am a GP in a practice with um, a number of colleagues. Uh, we've got six and a half thousand patients and I'm just a good old general regular general practice. Um, I also work as the clinical lead for transgender health in Ōtutahi. Um, and in terms of the model of care, we have uh, an, a community informed um, informed consent model like Rona's. We see people um, for starting gender affirming hormones without referral to um, any outside um, services at all in terms of capacity assessments. Yes, for help um, around care in terms of um, Probably one of the highlights really of our service is this very good mental health support package that we have. So not about assessing people, about supporting people, because we know this community does, mostly due to stigma stress, have higher mental health needs. And so we have a package of care where as a GP, you can refer to uh, funded peer support. And we work really closely with the, um, the peer support people and or, and or to um, psychology. And all the psychologists are um, gender um, capable, informed people that work closely with this community. And we all have um, group meetings together just to kind of, you know, support each other and work out the best way forward. So, um, yeah, that's probably our highlights of um, how we work here. Oh, the other probably the only other thing to say is we take uh, GP to GP referrals as well as uh, caring for patients that are enrolled within our own service. So there are eight of us in Christchurch, nine, sorry now, in Christchurch that um, will take an electronic referral or an email from other GPs um, and see that patient, initiate the hormones and then return that patient to the care of their usual GP with a bit of information and a discharge letter. Yeah still within primary care but kind of just across sideways and then back to yep. the original provider that's that's it. thanks Rebecca and Beth what would you like to tell us about your highlight of your service oh well um my name is Beth McElroy she her pronouns um and I'm a GP in Napier in Hawke's Bay so I job share in a, a regular GP practice with my husband um there's um about seven and a half thousand patients as well and um really what the road I went down was that about a year and a half ago we secured funding for a free fully funded um, trans health service in that services the whole community across the whole of Hawke's Bay across the age span which which um, has really worked really well it's been a very much an evolving process um, and I take referrals from everywhere across Hawke's Bay um, and I work alongside so our service has been allowed to with the funding, we have one session a week of GP, um, one day a week of nurse, dedicated nurse and dedicated reception time. So it's not a lot of time, but it's allowed us to sort of assess the need and to try and provide a free service as, um, as quickly as possible for people. And I use the informed consent model as well for over 18s. For the under 18 age group, I still, um, I've got a psychologist that I work alongside. And probably the highlight for me this, this year at the moment is we've just secured funding for mental health. So that, um, you know, based on Rebecca's model in Christchurch, we've got hopefully get funding coming for everybody for mental health support, whether that's peer support, psychologist, psychiatrist or counsellor. So I'm really looking forward to what that's going to look like. That's, that's great. That's so exciting. And in terms of pathways and developing services, that's something we did want to talk about in this webinar. Yeah. So thanks. That's great, Beth. I want to bring us back to Rona and ask, because all three of you have mentioned the words informed consent as a kind of, we use the informed consent model and this is the thing. Um, 
or maybe maybe I'll I'll put this to Rebecca. Yeah, I'll come back. Rona, you can have a different question about nurses. Rebecca, thinking about that informed consent model, how is that different to what was happening previously in your service? So uh, previously in Canterbury, we had the old model, which um, <laughs> required required um, initially, what do they call them? I think they just called them psychiatric or psychological assessments. And then the name changed to a readiness assessment. Mm. But And so it went from two assessments. You had to have a psychologist and, or, and a psychiatrist. Then it was just one mental health professional. And then the informed consent model uh, supports patient autonomy and uh, and means that yeah you know a patient can present the same way they would with any other health care need and between uh, educating the patient with them um, you know letting me know what their wishes are we can come to an agreement around you know care and what that looks like for them um, and provide it uh, certainly with no external uh, mental health assessment of any sort required but that doesn't mean mental health care can't happen that's a very different different thing and people often you know are really um, positive and want that care because um, as we know across the spectrum in health there's you know a big gap in mental health care and so it's it's great to be able to provide that um, and GPs are quite um nervous of the cons of the idea of informed consent when you talk about it um at, at, you know education sessions and things but they don't realize it's what they do every single day in every area of health it's just suddenly when you put a title on it it seems a bit fearsome but it's exactly what you do when you talk about the pros and cons of going on blood pressure medications and what the side effects might be and you know taking in consideration their lifestyle and that side effect and whether the family are, you know that's going to get in the way of their job it's all exactly what we do all of the time um and so, yeah, um, some of those patients I know really well, and some patients have come from GPs and it's the first time I've met them, but exactly the same way I would be able to do informed consent mm. for starting diabetes medication or any other medication, I can do that with this care. Now, occasionally you do get complex patients. I think GPs think that when you start, it's going to be nine complex patients and, you know, one easy patient, but it's absolutely not in my entire last five four years I've had two patients that I've referred through to um, psychiatric services to ask for a capacity assessment essentially because I it wasn't somebody I could determine in general practice whether they were understanding the um, information and able to um, you know manipulate it mm. and, and whether they really truly understood what the outcomes were and they were very complex people um, but as I say two two yeah, and yeah. years so yeah most people are very straightforward and it's a delight to um, work through that process with them. I like you pointing out how informed consent is so much the bedrock of what GPs do all the time. I mean, it is for a lot of healthcare providers. I think that's so true. It's just, there's an extra layer often of like worry about whether people really can make this decision because it, it can seem like a really scary decision or process if you're not a trans or non-binary person, it's sometimes hard for people to imagine why people would do this or how we are. That's just, you know, it's from a different perspective. It's hard for me to imagine what it might be like to be a cisgender person. Apparently it's also hard to imagine being a transgender or non-binary person. Um, yeah, so. I, I think I'm, again, it's just like every minority group. It's once you've met a few people, you've talked to a few people, and you've done it's this. Not so standard. scary. Yeah, it's just not scary at all. It's yeah. very straightforward. You know, it's it, yeah, yeah. Like anyone, yeah. you just need to ask the right questions and have a two-way dialogue around it. Mm -mm -mm. Yeah, make sure people have a realistic expectation and understand the risks and all of that normal stuff. Yeah, cool. And there are great resources and um, yeah, Rona's been the clinical lead for um, some primary care guidelines that are coming out soon, which again will just add mm. another layer of just take you through this step by step. And I think that will help allay a lot of fears as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you'd like, it's nice to have it kind of laid out in a step by step way. Well, let's, let's bring it back to Rona and 
you particularly mentioned nursing or working with a nurse in your service. And I know that we've had nurses register for this webinar. So would you like to share a bit more about the role of nurses in this context? Yeah, sure. Before I do that, <clears throat> I just want to sort of totico what Re Rebecca said, you know, just 100% agree and I've had the, exactly the same experience maybe one two people where it's been like needed a bit of help from external but otherwise it's straightforward these are your patients GPs are the perfect people to provide holistic you know all-round care for people and um and yeah it's a it's a delight and a pleasure and so you know don't don't be scared is what I would say but back to nurses yeah so I've been really lucky um that we've kind of set up this role in our clinic um where a nurse has got some dedicated time to to do this work and um and we you know we've got a really nice way of working together to support the students and um, to access the gender affirming health care that they want so most of the students who come through who, who are coming to our clinic specifically because they want to start hormones you know we do see a lot of people where that's the reason they come so a lot of those will, will initially see that see the nurse it's kind of it's not like essential but that's the kind of pathway that we sort of guide them down um, and it's really like an introductory appointment that I think our nurse does a lot of kind of navigator sort of role as well so a lot of that could be done potentially by a peer navigator if we had one um, so lots of information sharing finding out sort of what um, uh, what the you know what the student what the patient is is wanting to access explaining what's available and how things work smoothing the path really setting up healthcare appointments giving hormone information um, and a lot of it's about relationship building as well. You know, we know people, a lot of people have had prior negative healthcare experiences. Um, there's historical power imbalances. There's all that kind of stuff going on. So a lot, just a really nice kind of welcome to the service, somebody safe who they can, they can talk to and find out the information they need. Um, and she'll also do things like checking we've got the right name and pronouns on the computer system and um, letting them know about how to access counseling if it's something that they want. And then some medical things as well, which really help help save me time. So getting some, you know, blood pressure, uh, family history, past medical history, all that kind of stuff. And if people want to are interested in fertility preservation, for example, she can get the baseline blood test done. Um, so all this information sharing and gathering means that when someone comes to see me, I can just focus my time more on that, on the medical kind of prescriber stuff around the hormones and do things um, much quicker than I would have otherwise, because yeah, so it really kind of smooths the pathway for, for patients and for myself so we can we can all kind of work to our strengths. Um, and it's a real team approach as well. So we have um, time for sort of MDT so the nurse and I and our counsellors can get together and discuss any shared clients who, who might need to be discussed. Um, and, um, and we have peer supervision, time for peer supervision as well, which I know is a real, you know, they're all nice to have but really make make a big difference um and of course the nurses have a big role to play with testosterone injections as well and or teaching people how to self-inject if they want to do um for example self-inject sustenon and things like that so yeah mm, mm, that's it absolutely. in a nutshell how we, how we do that yeah thanks rona that's great i want to bring us to beth and you mentioned recent success with funding for a service is, is there something you wanted to share about that process that would be relevant to other people who might be thinking, oh, I really wish we had a so-and-so or a such-and-such -such as part of our service, or this yeah. isn't something we do, how do we fund it? Absolutely, and it's been a, it's been a huge learning curve for me um, <laughs> through the whole process, and I realized that um, early on that I was trying to see my patients through my clinic, but I realized I needed more time, I needed, more, I needed funding for some of these patients who didn't have access um, because they were coming to see me from other practices and they were being car you know, charged casual fees. And, you know, the GP model is difficult for some patients, um, regardless of the health needs that they've got. So I, I already attended an MDT at the hospital at the DHB um, with endocrine and the mental health team. Um, and through that process over the last couple of years, I made contacts through planning and funding. So the planning and funding team has been crucial to getting funding for this service and trying to highlight and advocate for this community at DHB level. And I think it coincided with a lot of national coverage as well. And it meant that I could, I could get access to um, the right people at the and just keep asking. And I just kept asking, kept asking, kept asking, kept saying, we need funding, we need funding, we need funding for this. And eventually um, I got the right person and we managed to get a contract secured, um, a sort of indefinite contract, which has been great. But I quickly realized that wasn't enough. 
So six months later, you know, I went back and said, okay, I actually need more than this. And I've had a lot of help advocate, you know, advocating, but it's been a huge learning curve as a GP. This isn't what we're taught to do. Um, and it is, I mean, it's amazing what you can do. And I think you can use this model for other things, not just for trans health, but for other things that are important in your practice. And just knowing how to do that and knowing how to access and write a business case because that's something i've had to learn is how to write a business case so um i mean i'm very happy to share that with people if they're interested in how to do that um just to try and get the best health care for people and then it's amazing then what comes out of that mm. so, you know it's been a really interesting process absolutely yeah yeah rebecca are you waving i am waving <laughs> um I, I just wanted to say in terms of what Beth just said with Healthcare New Zealand I think we're about to get the opportunity to put out um, I think they're putting out things called RFPs and so uh, specifically in primary care for trans health and so people do need to start thinking about what they would like to ask for and what would be useful in the area because different things are more you know some some areas will have very good mental health care or um, you know, a good ratio of nurses to doctors or whatever other areas, you know, completely the opposite. And so, you you know, there will be money coming and, and people really do need to think about what their gaps are and how best that could serve the community and, you know, make this possible. Mm, yeah, filling different gaps in different places because it is just wildly inconsistent um, what different people have as clinicians available to them in any given place, right? Which is similar to the patient experience. It's wildly different what you can get at any given time. So yeah, anything we can do to increase people's resourcing, I think is really important. I, it's like, I really want to steer us away from thinking this is a specialist kind of thing. Like I want it to be resourced and regarded as important, but I want that to be as part of primary care because primary care is important and should be resourced and trans and non-binary people are part of your patient load and part of your community and part of the context that you're working in. So situating it really firmly as part of the everyday primary care work and advocating from that place, I can certainly speak to the value of that as someone who's been working in trans health as an advocate, you know, that's so much what we want. Um, and it's, I know it's tempting for some people to want it to be a, a different specialist over there kind of thing. And if we can, if we can embrace it as part of primary care, which obviously some people are doing and doing really well. So, you know, Rona is running a peer group for GPs working in this space. Um, you can get in touch through myself through Moira through our website form we'll get you in touch with Rona if you want to join that or get more information about it um, we would also recommend joining PATHA that's another way that you can get access to a, a wider network of people working in this space and you can always post questions about I'm looking for a person who could help me with this or that or my patients just moved to this place and do you think there's anyone there that kind of, often it's um that kind of question comes up quite a lot on the PATHA list. Yeah, I think I just just to um, I, we were all talking, you know, before this webinar, and and all the GPs that are on this panel were in absolute agreement that it is it's such a rewarding thing to do in general practice, and it's rewarding because it's like it feels like it's the the pinnacle of general practice in the sense that you have a patient that has you know, mental health needs, physical health needs, really interesting medicine around all the sort of endocrinology and um, that you that really interesting relationships around, you know, families and whanos and, and peer support and communi other community organ. It just is this beautiful, it can just be such a wonderful package of everything that we are trying to always, you know, sing the praises of in general practice is that we're these fantastic generalists that have to think about all of these things and, and it, you know, you can do that in a, a number of consults for patients and it feels extremely rewarding. It is a lifelong, it's a lifelong journey for the patient and to have a GP going on that journey with them to meet all those health needs, not just the, you know, the gender health, but the, the cardiovascular health, the respiratory health, everything else. It's so important to have a GP that you trust and that you know to go on that sort of pathway, you know, that path with you. Um, and that's what I find really rewarding. 
you know, that they'll come to me with other problems as well, you know, especially the ones that come to the gender clinic. They're like, oh, I couldn't talk to my own, you know, I can talk to you because you understand the trans aspect of this. And I think it's really important that um, with your own patients that you have that relationship um, because hopefully we have that already with them. Um, yeah, that's right. It's not like things don't fit into neat little boxes. It's like, well, you go there for the little hormone bit because that's not related to anything else in your life. You, you know, so with the GPs are the perfect people or primary care for, yeah, all those bits. It's not like, you know, there's lots of things that we talk about in those appointments. It's not just about let's do your hormone prescription. Of course it is because that's what all GP appointments are like. Whereas when you go to different secondary care places, they're not, it's not often like that because they do have their little areas of speciality. And it, that is a really relevant question that we've had a lot from people feeling really squashed for time. You know, can you fit all this into a 15 minute appointment? How do you do this in one session? Ah, oh, that panicked feeling, which we can all understand. How do you respond to that worry? Anyone? Rebecca. <laughs> I mean, I think it's like any other care. You get people that walk in the door that are incredibly informed, incredibly well supported, uh, you know, are all over it, really just have a very specific need around um, hormones. And yeah, you can you can do it in, a, in 15 minutes. It, I, I would say most patients aren't 15 minutes, but but it, it, every patient is different. And the way that Rona has written the guidelines is that it's the sort of idea of stages and like any care, some people can, you can do that stage, you know, very quickly. Other people may take, you know, months and months and months. And it's depending on what else is happening in their life and, you know, resourcing and headspace for them and all sorts of things. So, um, yeah. Yes, you can fit it into 15 minutes, but equally you don't have to if it's not the right thing to do. And and as long as you've got good open communication and good resources for patients explaining kind of what you are expecting to get into this consult and what the process is, then it's um it works really well as a staged process. And as Rona says, working in with other people like your nursing team or um in my case, the hip and the practice, the um, mental health worker, et cetera, you know. That, that kind of collaborative care it works very well yeah I don't I I don't think I can do this in 15 minutes but then I'm notorious for having running over and having long appointments you know and for a lot of more complex things I've booked yeah you know, I've, I've got the luxury that people don't have to pay to to come to the service so I you know book, book people for double appointments but um I do think it takes time to properly, you know, if you're going to really listen to somebody's goals for gender affirming hormones, you're going to really explain all the information to, to properly do informed consent and give them all that information. You know, possibly you want to, for trans feminine people might want a referral to fertility associates, you want to discuss that and organize them. But, you know, I think just those that conversation takes longer than 15 minutes uh, to, to me. But uh, again, everyone's really, really individual, like Rebecca says, and especially, especially if someone's seen the nurse first, it, you know, sometimes it's super quick and people are like, what, is that it? Do I have to do anything else? Because I can't think of anything else to do. <laughs> we can try and think of something. But um, but everyone's very, um, very different. And I think with, some people need a bit of time as well to think about the information you've given them. You know, you're giving them lots of information. So if you're able to see them again quite soon after that, they can go away, think about it all, look at all the information you've given them and then come back with any questions and then, and then do the prescription then. So that's probably quite a, a good way of doing things, but everyone's different, doctors and patients. And, and if everybody's feeling, I'm listening to Rona and I with that is, the next step is, I, I don't know what that information is. I don't, you know, so we've talked about, you know, the fact that part of informed consent is obviously sharing their goals, but us then um, sharing back medical facts and um, discussion around fertility and all that stuff. And, and, and most GPs won't know that. And that's absolutely fine. I think there's a lot of education coming as part of the health NZ package. So I think more and more will be available. There's obviously things like this webinar starting off. And if people want to, to start somewhere and you know start to upskill themselves around that, there's Rona's Good Fellow podcast, which is very good and you know talks about the the, you know, what doses and side effects and all of that stuff that you need for that, that informed consent model. But there are a number of other really good resources as well. I, mean, I think the Aotearoa guidelines are fabulous and they're just worth, a, you know, an hour's working through those and having a look. And, and as I say, I think there'll be more to come. So 
people can feel really like they're doing a good job because that's what GPs want to do is mm. they want to make sure they've done a really good job for people and feel competent about something. Mm. Yeah, and feel like that relationship is strong with that person that you're providing healthcare to. I, I know someone in the chat has asked about when you don't know a whole lot about trans people and their journey, like how do you become inclusive? How do you be inclusive? And I think some of you are already answering that because it's a lot about upskilling yourself I mean, feel free to add to this if you'd like to, but I think there are a lot of resources under this webinar and there are a lot of resources on our website. And if those places were the places where you started, you would find quite a lot to get into. Um, that's, that's is quite a lot of work that's already gone into providing as much information as possible to people to do this work. Um, so yeah, also, it, yes, you go, Rana. Oh, it's worth mentioning that some the health pathways are really different depending on where you work but in some True. areas they have been updated and are helpful some less so <laughs> um and uh, and i'll just say because rebecca has sort of referred to these primary care guidelines and people might wonder what that's all about so there are guidelines um, which have been written which are coming out soon which really is specifically around this to guide people working in primary care who want to start gender affirming hormone therapy um, for adults and it really does guide you through those sort of stages that Rebecca referred to. It kind of gives, you know, some background. How do you do this? What do you need to what do you need to know? What information do you need to tell patients? And what are the sort of steps to go through? And literally like what to prescribe and when and how much. So um, hopefully they'll be out really soon. And we'll, you know, people who want to get get into doing more of this, they'll, they'll really help you alongside the national guidelines, which are also really excellent and freely available online. Just if you just Google them or look at the link on the on the resources for this webinar. And we do have such an opportunity working here, like New Zealand has um, obviously in some ways a very impoverished healthcare system, but also we have ways of doing things here that don't rely on, um, for example, medical insurance. In, in America, a lot of their standards of care and the ways that things are written to support people getting access to gender affirming care is kind of ticking a lot of boxes for various insurance based purposes which really prevents it from being as patient centered or as as much about the informed consent approach whereas here we have a chance to do things in a really and I think this is what the primary care guidelines would encourage and it's certainly what the existing patha guidelines encourage to do things more holistically and more with the person in front of you in mind you know it's it's what their goals are. It's what they're looking for. You need to listen to what that person is saying. You won't, you can certainly have access to all the resources and things that might give you further background and framework, but it really will be a process of listening to someone describe what they're looking for and a process of working out whether they know what the risks are and what the impact will be of various things. You know, it's that, it's the, it's a conversation. So yeah. yeah. I can't kind of emphasize, agree with you more, Joe. Uh, the, that's why health pathways are really difficult to write. For yeah. <laughs> because every, you can't, it's not, you know, like an ear infection, step one, look at this, step two, you know, this antibiotic. It, it, everybody will choose something different. And, and in terms of where do I start? And, you know, if you don't, you're not very informed about this, I actually think the best thing you can do is just sit back with the patient in front of you and say, what are your goals? What are you hoping for? What are the sorts of things you're seeking? Ignore what is or isn't available in my area. I would just like to hear what it is that you, and then let's see what we can do with what I know is available. And so through those conversations, you'll realize that every single person, I, yes, I do want speech language therapy, but no, I don't want that hormone but you know I may want this later on and and you know there's just so it's a great conversation and you just build on your knowledge from those conversations basically. I completely agree Rebecca that um, everybody's journey is so individual I mean some people it might just be I have people who come and talk to me and said say I just want to change my pronouns that's all I want to do you know and they just want some advice around that or I get parents who come in with a younger child and say what do we do we've got a six-year-old who you know um identifies as a boy and we just I just give advice and at that point you don't need to do anything or there's no referrals needed you just support them and say to the parents you're doing a great job just support your child and the journey is different for every single person and it's talking to them and finding out what you're right what is the, what is it they want to achieve from this um from this appointment basically from this you know from this discussion it's just and it's like that's okay 
And it's okay if that's all you want and you don't have to go any further. You don't have to sign a contract and take estrogen for the rest of your life. Or, you know, you might take it for a year and stop. You might take testosterone for take two years and stop. It's just, it's mm. all the individual. Um, and I mean, the patient will guide you as well. You know, there's no right or wrong answers here. It's just, it is a discussion. It's a really important to listen. That's, that's so relevant because one of the questions we've talked about is, you know, what if someone changes their mind being a very common concern that people have if they're prescribing hormones and you're already responding to that, Beth, but does anybody have a further sense of what you would say to that? Love that one, Joey. <laughs> I honestly think it's one of the biggest barriers for a lot of clinicians. But yeah. what I say is it wasn't your choice. It's not, it's not, you are not responsible for if that patient decides at some stage that they don't want to take hormones anymore or they want to start and stop. Or that isn't that isn't your response. You haven't done anything wrong. And there is a real feeling, you know, that you somehow as a clinician didn't choose the right thing for that patient and that's not what this is about at all it was the patient's choice and you facilitated what was right for that patient at that time um and I have had patients uh detransition and you know and people it, it, it does happen and um and what I say is look there's not a great deal of research at the moment, but the research shows pretty universally that people are detransitioning because there isn't support in their community or their family or their workplace, not because they actually felt they did the wrong thing at, the, at that time. Most people would still like to be their chosen gender, but it's just too hard. Um, and certainly that has been the experience of the patients that I've had that have detransitioned. And of those patients, a number of them have gone back on hormones when their life has settled down and you know and, and they've got more support and they're in a better place so I just say to clinicians if you can let that go and let people make some choices and never feel like um, you know that you were somehow to blame for some wrong thing happening then and 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 with a really good informed consent then whatever the um, that patient is left with in terms of body change and things, you've gone over that. So if they detransition, that is again fully they were fully informed what would happen in terms mm. of you know, what what would remain. I and yeah, again it and just becomes a conversation for me, and I you know ask that patient if they want support and find that support that we need for them. And it's just not as linear, right? It's not as linear as you do it or you don't do it. That's just not like that, you know? And, and I think more and more we're hearing from people who might identify as non-binary or, or it, and not that that's the catch-all that everyone would use, but for myself, I feel like, you know, my transition goals or my gender goals are quite different being a non-binary person than it would be if I really wanted to present as a man or as a woman, like that's not my goal. So it, and at the beginning of the kind of maybe 10 years ago process where I was seeking healthcare, that was really hard for people to grasp. It was really a challenge, but that's changed. People are talking more about um, what it might mean for them to be affirmed in their gender when their gender is non-binary or not a man or not a woman, or, you know, it's, it's, we've got more nuance now. And I love that. I think that's, that's related to just embracing the informed consent approach and saying of course people can change their minds that's that's consent you can uh, you know what is consent if you can't change your mind you you that would you'd be signing up for something you couldn't undo like of course you need to know which things will not be undoable but that's part of the process yeah absolutely and I think um it's definitely something that people might not say it but it's what they're scared about and I think it's really um what's the word like you know just sort of um Oh, helpful for the prescriber to think it's not your decision. You're not the one deciding whether hormones are right or wrong or whether this should be, you know, you're, you're talking to an adult who's making their own decisions about their body and you're giving them all the information they need. The, your patient is making that decision, not, not you. So don't worry. I guess kind of that feeling of kind of moving that pressure off, off the prescriber and, mm. you know, that's okay. And, and yeah. And, and as Beth said, some people will, you know, might, especially with say testosterone might say well I'll take it for a bit get some of these changes and then stop it because I've got those changes you know there's all different ways of doing it and it's and it's all fine as long as you've got a good informed consent process that people can have the information to make their own decisions yeah absolutely and I know we've got a question about how people can join PATHA 
which we definitely have information about that on our website, which we can pop in the chat for you. And also the Patha website itself. If you Google Patha, you'll find it. Um, yeah, there's a sliding scale of cost as well. So it doesn't have to be prohibitive on that level. Um, and I would highly recommend it. This, this kind of conversation and where this has gotten to, it really wouldn't be possible without some infrastructure to support the learning and development and the resources sharing. And that's, Patha provides a lot of that. So um, certainly recommend it. We also have a question, one specifically that I think we might follow up with Rebecca about, but that's about accessing a psychologist um, and someone who's based in Dunedin and wanting to refer to the Christchurch group or wondering if there's someone local. I feel, do you feel also Rebecca that we can follow that up after? Cause it's kind of more, it's more about specifics. That's all right. It, I just wanted to acknowledge that that question has come through and that that's a really common query for people to have. But instead of going into the nitty gritty of you could refer to this person or that person, I think we'll just follow that up later. So although it might be worth pointing out that that is about that sort of more model of seeing a psychologist for a readiness assessment. So if there are GPs in Dunedin who would like to learn how to start hormones themselves without requiring a readiness assessment for everyone then yeah that's also an option this is prior to an endocrine referral for hormone the, therapy so there'll be yeah. an endocrine requirement that there is that and that's yeah but instead of doing that that would it be can great. come into general practice and i think that's the thing to share is that some i've heard gp say but we can't prescribe those hormones like we're not allowed to or something but you can mm. um, but you do need the information to be able to share it with your patients but in you know that could be something that GPs in Dunedin might want to look into um, a pathway that doesn't involve an automatic endocrine yeah because again I'm just repeating I don't use a psychologist as any way prior to hormones it, and it, if I do it's concurrent not for an assessment but because that patient might need some psychological support around you know their mental health needs it's it's in no way is it a the psychologist tells me that it's okay for that patient to start hormones as we have said over and over and over again the patient tells me that it's okay for and then I work out medically how that can happen and yeah we go from there so there is there is absolutely no assessment required by a psychologist it's a, and I think that's worth repeating yeah I don't refer to I don't refer to endocrine and I don't refer and I don't get a psychology assessment any counseling or other support is, is alongside the, the hormone stuff Mm, yeah and and acknowledging that when people are working in isolation it's very hard to imagine that you might take on an area area of work that is not something you've known a lot about so it takes some learning and some some reading and some following up with people which I appreciate this person is here learning <laughs> in in the room so you're on it you're doing it we'll get there Beth did you have something you wanted to add I was just going to say because um because I started doing this and um the MDT has been really supportive for me because I do meet with the MDT once a month and I discuss any sort of tricky ones with endocrine and um, I find a lot of the younger ones that I see are often complex then there's a lot of complexity to them and I do um, I do discuss those with mental health and do get a psychologist for the younger ones but for the over 18s just about every single one I would do with the informed consent model so I don't use a psychologist for the over 18s unless there's a mental health need um, so that's, that's, I think that's a really, really important point to reiterate, but yeah, the younger ones that are more complex, I still discuss with mental health. Um, can I just mention as well, I mean, that we have all come on a big, on our own learning journey. And like you say, Joey, we're not saying, oh, you should be doing it just like this. Um, and certainly we've had a lot of help in our service from our endocrinologists. So I think having that relationship with your local endocrinologist to sort of say, hey, I would like to do this in primary care. And maybe you can help me with when I've got questions or you know um mm. and, and those mdt approaches that's how we've that's how well certainly in wellington that's how we've learned as well and upskill so yeah it hadn't just doesn't just happen overnight no it's so it so doesn't it was a, it was a um in in canterbury it was a you know everyone that provided care getting together and having a chat so surgeons endocrinologists pediatricians all of us just got you know community members peer support people all of us got round a table and then a, a core group of that have continued and so it's made these beautiful relationships across the so I could pick up the phone to an endocrinologist tomorrow if I needed to I wouldn't send the patient to them but if I didn't know the answer myself that I know them they know me I know my peer support person, you know, et cetera. And it is, if you just mm. develop that, that's what makes it such an amazing 
uh, work because you you just yeah get everybody going. But I think that really helps to identify there's often one GP somewhere that really wants to provide this care and so they become the GP champion and their job is then often to reach out to you know the the players essentially in the area and 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 bring people together and people are very keen to come together and believe me secondary care is very happy for this to be provided <laughs> in oh, primary surprising, care. yeah <laughs> yes yes surprise so yeah it is it's just it's just wonderfully relationship driven right across everything yeah we have just a couple more minutes before we're going to do our wrap up, but we do have a good question here of someone saying that it's been really empowering and that they understand the prescribing can be done in primary care. How much time do you think it would take within the confines of ordinary general practice, i.e. without the extra funding, and is there value in splitting things out across multiple consults? Short answer is can I, yes. Can I do that? I can do the just normal general practice um, without funding, that's kind of how, well, with the support of peer support was kind of how we started rolling with it. Um, and the, the answer to that is probably the best thing you can do is wait for the primary care guidelines because I created the ones in, in Autotahi to start with. And the answer is that now as an experienced GP, a pretty standard thing would be a half, a quarter of an hour with the nurse, half an hour with me start the hormones if the person doesn't need fertility treatment they can walk away with that um with that prescription at the end of that first and then I see them two half hour appointments after that that would be the sort of standard thing but remembering some people less some people definitely mm, mm, need mm. more they might need family to come in or they might need whatever so mm. um yes it is absolutely possible to do in standard general practice without funding it's just bloody hard if you've got no funding because what do you charge a patient what you know etc 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 so I, I really mm. advocate for it and we definitely got funding for general practice from our PHO for those consults so that those half hour consult the patient just pays a standard not a casual if they're coming from elsewhere a standard GP um, amount for a half hour consult with a different GP than the usual one. Thanks Rebecca. I guess we have to leave it there. This has been really great. I really appreciate it. <clears throat> um, I, I felt like the questions needed their time, so I'm not going to do a big wrap up spiel, um, but I do want to remind people that doing advocacy in this space often requires evidence and data and that the Counting Ourselves survey, um, which was done a couple of years ago, is about to be redone. So another nationwide survey of trans and non-binary people in our health and well-being. And that's why we're doing our third webinar with the Counting Ourselves team who can talk more about it. So if you haven't registered for our next webinar, please do, or please circulate the information to anyone you think might be interested. Um, that's, that's one way that we're trying to provide the support so that you can advocate for funding or advocate for your needs um, as primary care providers. I really want to thank our panelists, our speakers. Um, you are excellent and you've been excellent. And I will leave it maybe there to say, um, I am hopeful that with people like yourselves saying, hey, this isn't scary, we can all do this. We, are, we keep chipping away. We keep making things better step by step. Um, so thank you. And I'm asking Moira if you feel like closing us with karakia since we opened that way. <laughs> unmuting unmuting kia ora joey thank you and thanks yeah thanks to all of our panelists and thanks everybody for taking the time to be here whether it's live with us this evening or watching this recording um you know how hard this is to fit in around everything else you've got going on in your lives so really appreciate your time to be here and to learn about this um important area of healthcare as well um so yeah i'll just close as we started with the with the karakia Thank you.